Tēnākoutou everyone, my name is Luke Percy, I'm the head of web CMS at Catalyst. While I myself might be new to the Drupal community, Catalyst definitely isn't. Uh, we've been giving back, you know, giving back to the community is important to us and Catalyst developers are actively in helping Drupal's issues, queues, as well as other external sites like Drupal Answers. Catalyst also contributes beyond code modules and documentation, such as hosting the Wellington Drupal meetups. Uh, we're credited on over 30 issues in the past three months, but you can come check us out on drupal.org if you want to see more. Um, I'm proud to introduce today uh, Gian Wild. Uh, she will be doing a talk on mobile accessibility, testing mobile sites for accessibility, something that we value at Catalyst as well. And uh, let's, without further ado, get into it. Hi, thanks everyone. Thanks for attending and uh, thanks for our great session organisers um, and event air. Uh, I'd like to talk about mobile accessibility today. Um, now, a lot of uh, you are probably aware that there are <clears throat> There's uh, uh, WCAG requirements around accessibility. So, you know, why can't we just use them for mobile? Um, and basically, I'll just give you a bit of a history. So the ICT Accessibility Testing Symposium uh, in October 2017, this is a conference that occurs uh, once a year. Uh, it's spe specifically aimed at accessibility testers. And at the end of the conference, we have what's called a town hall where we, uh, you know, ask the, the uh, testers and the people in the industry, what is it that um, <clears throat> really needs to be addressed in the accessibility industry that hasn't been, you know, really properly addressed. And in the 2017 se uh, session, the overwhelming majority of people talked about mobile uh, accessibility testing. And so the problem, of course, with um, <clears throat> Mobile is that WCAG wasn't uh, written for mobile. Um, I spent six years with the W3C contributing to WCAG 2 and, you know, it was released in 2008. Of course, the first iPhone was released in 2007, but of course, the majority of the work was completed in 2006. So we really just had no concept of how, uh, you know, people would use mobile to access the internet. So what we did uh, first off uh, in 2018, I was the chair of the committee, was we amalgamated the various different mobile guidelines from around the world. So the BBC mobile accessibility guidelines, uh, the Paciello group had one as well. Uh, we Accessibility Oz um, had one and uh, we also incorporated uh, DQ's um, accessibility guidelines as well. So we kind of incorporated all these into one set and we were really looking forward to uh, not having to do anything more again because we knew WCAG 2.1 would be released in June 2018. So, you know, we thought this was a one and done kind of deal. Now, just uh, but I'll just sort of take a step back and explain why mobile is different to desktop. Mobile has a lot of native screen readers, uh, such as a talkback narrator, voiceover. It's very different to the desktop environment where people, you know, don't like the screen reader, screen readers that are available uh, like JAWS and go off and build something like NVDA. You really can't do that on mobile. You're stuck with the, um, the uh, mobile features that are incorporated in the mobile device that you're using. Um, and not just screen readers, there's also volume control, haptic, you know, vibrational notifications, text-to-speech, speech recognition, Zoom, etc. Uh, and a number of system accessibility settings that, uh, you know, people with disabilities uh, will use, but a lot of people without disabilities or without defining themselves as someone with a disability would use as well, such as font size, touch and hold delay, screen rotation, high contrast, assistive touch and mono audio. And so you've got a lot of more people using these settings, even if they aren't actually, uh, you know, seeing themselves as, as uh you know, having a disability and these settings can really, you know, play havoc when it comes to mobile sites. So let's go back to WCAG 2.1. But before we go to WCAG 2.1, let's talk about WCAG 2. So WCAG 2, yes, uh, success criteria are applicable to mobile. You know, alt attributes are required on images, whether it's on a mobile site or a desktop site. Um, however, not all aspects of mobile accessibility are specifically covered by WCAG 2. 
So, for example, although WCAG 2 requires sites to be accessible to the keyboard user, it does not specify that it should also be accessible to the touchscreen user, which, of course, is a major requirement when it comes to mobile. So 2.1 was released in June 2018. And it does address more criteria relating to touchscreen, pointer gestures, sensors and small screen devices. However, it still doesn't really cover all the user needs related to mobile accessibility. And if you ever have anyone ask you, well, you know, what is it about 2.1 that doesn't, uh, you know, meet the real criteria that, you know, is needed in the real world? Uh, the best example is uh, touch target size. So we've all had cases where we've gone to touch something and it's too small right and so you pinch zoom to make it larger or maybe you activate something that is close to it because everything's just too small now that's a real problem for people with disabilities so it's really important that uh you know that things have an adequate touch target size or there is an ability to say pinch zoom now um that requirement is in WCAG 2.1, but it's relegated to level AAA. And as I like to say, level AAA is where success criterion go to die. So that is the problem, is that yes, there is a really important requirement, but people aren't necessarily going to even come across it, let alone implement it um, in 2.1. So another thing with WCAG 2.1 requires um, page variations. So now this is actually required in two, WCAG 2 as well, but I just thought that I would uh, address it now because it's something that a lot of people get confused about. So low vision users who use the zoom function inherent in the browser often are restricted to a mobile view of the site on their desktop. So as part of WCAG 2, you may, must be able to zoom to 200% and access all the uh, functionality and everything as required. Um, and so the functionality is not removed just because you're increasing uh, the zoom size. And this is an example here, and I just want to say that it has been fixed. But <clears throat> previously in YouTube, the uploaded notifications button on the desktop site were visible at 100% screen size, but not at 200% screen size. Now, why would that be? That's because they basically, if you hit 200% screen size on a desktop, you triggered the mobile uh, view of the, the site. And so they assumed that you were looking at YouTube through the mobile site. Now, why would you get rid of your upload and notifications on the mobile version of YouTube? because people would assume that you'd use the YouTube app to upload or, you know, access your account. So therefore you wouldn't have it on the site. However, of course, people who are using the desktop version at 200% aren't ever going to be able to access those things. So this is an example here, upload notifications visible at 100% and at 200% they disappear. So that there is a real problem and is why it's really important that whether you, whether you have a mobile site or a desktop site, that you provide all the same functionality on both versions of the site. And whether it's responsive or you have M.dot sites, doesn't matter, you need to have all the same functionality. Now you can hide the content if necessary, but you must have, you know, the same ability to do all the same things. Um, the other thing that uh, was in WCAG 2 but is really important now with 2.1 is accessibility supported. So basically it means that if there are accessibility techniques inherent in a device or a technology, say PDF or HTML, you must use those accessibility features. Um, and so that means that basically, you know, if you're using a PDF, you need to, you know, uh, tag that PDF. Uh, but basically what it means for mobile is, especially when it comes to native apps, you really need to actually do testing with assistive technologies because there's really no other way to determine uh, whether those uh native apps are using the features inherent in the, the system. Now, so this methodology covers a lot of things, but I just want to say it does not include things that are already in WCAG 2. So for example, it doesn't say, hey, your images need alt attributes, your headings need to be coded, because that's in WCAG 2. But it does include the new errors that are listed in 2.1. Uh, and that's because, you know, some uh, some countries or some organisations might still be meeting WCAG 2, but want to make their stuff mobile accessible. Now, it's very clear when something's a 2.1 requirement. Um, we have made some minor changes, so we, we disagree with some of the, uh, the things that 2.1, uh, you know, has come up with, but we make it very clear in the methodology 
what that is. So basically, the most important thing to remember is that you really need to test with real devices. So this is back when uh, you know I used to travel the world uh, before COVID, uh, and uh, I started doing a whole lot of international travel from 2014. And so you know it's a 14, 15 hour flight from Melbourne to LA, and you know there'll be no Wi-Fi because it was back in the dark ages, and we'd land on the tarmac and. I would be able to access the LAX Wi-Fi. However, on this LAX Wi-Fi page, it says this page will redirect so content doesn't really make sense to have here. And all of a sudden, I don't really feel safe giving you my email address or my credit card details or anything like that. So how did this happen? This happened because someone was testing on a desktop. They didn't test in the actual environment on an actual device. Uh, so that's something that's really, really important. You must test with actual devices. And uh, if you have location um, things, you need to test uh, in actual locations as well. So back to the story of the methodology. Uh, so 2018, the uh, committee reformed and said, well, actually, as a committee, we're quite unhappy with how WCAG 2.1 addressed mobile. So they we decided to reform the committee and uh, split it into two groups, one for native app, uh, mobile testing guidelines and one for mobile site uh, testing guidelines. And I was voted chair for both those groups. So we worked over the next year or so developing uh, methodolo a methodology, one for native apps and one for mobile sites. And they're both very, very similar. Um, but today I'll be talking about mobile sites. So basically, uh, the first thing we determined was the testing methods. What testing methods should we really undertake when it comes to mobile sites? So we decided that there were four main testing methods. One was devices, so testing on mobile and tablet devices. Secondly was test devices with assistive technologies. The third was responsive windows, so testing on a responsively sized window on desktop, and then also testing on desktop. Now, you know, notice there's no simulators there. There's no... Uh, kind of automated testing tools or anything like that. We really decided, as I mentioned before, simulators are not good enough, but the, the uh, testing tools that are available really aren't uh, robust enough to be able to rely on them at the moment. So the methodology itself has five steps. The first step is identify devices. The second step is identify site type and variations. The third step is test critical issues. The fourth step, test mobile specific issues. And the fifth step, test mobile assisted technology and feature support. And the reason why I've highlighted step two, identify site type and variations, that's the only difference between the mobile site testing methodology and the native app testing methodology is that that step is completely different uh, when it comes to native apps. There are different examples and things in terms of issues as well, but, uh, you know, that's where it really differs. So let's move to step one, identify devices. So the recommended devices and browser combinations we identified was iPhone with Safari, iPad with Safari, and an Android phone with Chrome. Now, you can use a Samsung phone, but if you do use it, do not use it with the internet browser that comes pre-installed with Samsung phones, because that's very indicative of what people will see on Samsung phones. Whereas if you use Chrome on Samsung, that'll be much more indicative of what everyone on the Android um, devices will see. Uh, and so it also, when it comes to choosing your devices, uh, definitely have a look at your uh, statistics. Uh, other things to consider are things like an Android tablet, for example, a Samsung Tab A or a Chromebook using Chrome again, and alternative devices such as a Kindle device if you have uh, content that's specifically going to those alternative devices. We're recommending testing on the latest version of iOS and the latest two versions of Android. And of course, where a site is directly aimed at people with a particular kind of disability, including assistive devices, you know, used by those people. So if you have a, a site that's specifically aimed at people with acquired brain injuries, for example, you're going to specifically want to test with uh, things like drag and naturally speaking, um, you know, and things like that, because those are the kind of technologies those people will use. And, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again, you need to meet WCAG 2 and this methodology. Um, you know, you can't just get away with this methodology. Um, the second step is the site type and 
the variations of the page. So the first thing you need to do is identify if the site is a desktop, MDOT or responsive site. And if there's a site is responsive, are there variations of the page? Now, I know this is a Drupal conference, so you know you probably all know what these terms are, but I'm just going to go through it just in case. So the desktop websites, uh, they only have one display, whether viewed on desktop, mobile or tablet. MDOT sites, they have a particular display for mobile and tablet sites. Now, if you have an MDOT site, you basically have two websites. The MDOT site needs to be tested against WCAG 2 on desktop and WCAG 2 and the mobile testing methodology on mobile. The um, And the other site also needs to be tested on both as well. So you're actually doubling the amount of work that you need to do. Because if you think about it, the MDOT site is a completely different site. Um, and don't think just because you've got an MDOT site that people won't look at the desktop on your mobile device or they won't look at the MDOT site on your desktop uh, because they will. They will always find a way. And we also have a clause in this methodology that you can only um, force users depending on to a certain you know, responsive site or an MDOT site versus on screen size, not on device or anything like that, because there will be people that absolutely want to look at the MDOT site on desktop uh, at 100% Zoom or want to look at the desktop site on mobile and you don't want to stop them from doing that. Um, and then, of course, the one that we really should all be doing and is actually a requirement of WCAG 2.1 is responsive websites. And hopefully that's what you're all doing. So uh, an example of a desktop site here, this is the Australian National Botanic Gardens. I just had to include this because this was the first website that ever went live in Australia. It has 49,000 pages. Not a single web page that has ever gone up on this site has ever come down. I do not recommend doing this when it comes to your websites. Um, but basically, Basically, if you look at this on a desktop and you pull, um, uh, you make the browser uh, thinner, you see the site doesn't change at all. Whereas this is a desktop versus an MDOT site. So this is a Sephora site. You can see you've got your navigation along the top. You know, it's nice and brown, et cetera, et cetera. And if you go to the MDOT version, you'll see it looks completely different. It's blue. You've got your hamburger menu on the top left, et cetera, et cetera. And in a mobile sales sized browser on desktop, you will see that they look completely different. And then, of course, you've got the responsive site. So this is the Accessibility Oz site. On desktop, you've got your navigation along the top. Um, and then when you make it smaller, the navigation changes, the services change. Nothing really disappears. It just all uh, re, uh, reformats as required. So the next step is to test the critical issues. So one of the things that we found really early on is that there are a whole lot more traps on mobile devices than there are on just desktop devices. So what is a trap? A trap is where a user is trapped within a component and cannot escape without closing the browser or the app. Think, you know, 2012 Firefox video players. A lot of people would keep, you know, tab into the video player and couldn't tab out. Uh, the only way to escape something like that, if you're a keyboard, user is to close the browser and start again. So basically, we identified things as traps where the only way to escape from the trap is to close the browser on your mobile, you know, or the native app. Um, so we found quite a few. The first one was the exit trap. Ensure there is always an accessible actionable item, e.g. a close button that meets color contrast requirements or has an accessible name that closes any feature that overlays the current page, such as a full page ad. Um, and so this is an example example here um, <clears throat> where the ad actually overlays the entire page and the only way to really close this ad is to close um, our, the app and start again. Uh, this is an example for a website. We've all seen these where it's got a pop-up that's trying to sell you something and the only way to close the pop-up is to hit that small um, close button which doesn't meet color contrast requirements or touch target size requirements and so you know basically you're stuck uh you can't go into the site you can't escape etc um <clears throat> swipe scroll traps ensure you do not override standard mobile touch functions swiping scrolling etc on the majority of the page uh so basically <clears throat> oh i don't know what i just did oh, computers uh so basically <laughs> this is an example where <clears throat> you scroll down to the bottom of the page and you can't scroll up. 
And the only way to get to the top of the page is to actually hit that uh, little arrow at the bottom right uh, and, you know, everything else is disabled. And, of course, that little arrow in the bottom right doesn't meet colour contrast requirements and, you know, isn't really understandable. This is <clears throat> another example. Uh, and I call this the zoom of doom. This is being fixed. This is one of the first errors I ever found. But basically, if you this, the map takes up so much of the page that you have to hit these tiny areas of white around the edge of the map to scroll the page. Otherwise, you scroll the map. Um, now, a lot of people are finding ways around that now by <coughs> having like the two finger scroll and things like that, which is great. But we still see these occasionally. The headset trap, <clears throat> headset users must always be able to pause media, audio or video content by using the pause play control on the headset. Applies to screen reader users and headset users. Uh, this is an example here where you're on a website, a little video pops up in the bottom. Uh, as a touch user, you can activate the mute uh, icon, but as a headset user or a screen set screen reader user, you you know activating the pause button will just pause the screen reader, not that uh, video content. And so basically, uh, they can't hear their screen reader and they can't use the rest of the page. And lastly, a layer trap. The user should not be trapped on a non-visible layer. It's, this applies to all users, but it's mostly encountered by screen reader users. This is an example here where you open the uh, hamburger menu and the focus for the screen reader user or the keyboard user um, it stays on the page underneath. So they can't access any of the menu information or close the menu. So let's see an example from the document. So uh, here is touch gestures. So any touch gesture must have an alternative accessible actionable item. Um, and this is very similar to success criterion 2.5.1 in pointer gestures, sorry, pointer gestures in 2.1. So examples of touch gestures are things like swiping up and down or left or right, dragging up and down or left and right, double tapping, tapping and holding, tapping and swiping, two pinch zoom and press and long hold. And so the alternative accessible gesture must meet WCAG 2 or 2.1, meet change of state, meet touch targets, meet inactive space, meet native UI, meet removal of touch. And so basically the examples of alternative accessible gestures that are just inherently accessible are things like a link, a button, a drop down, you know, or a separate page with functionality. So each requirement has a section that's called about this requirement, which explains why we need to follow it. So I'll read this to you now. Uh, this requirement is particularly important for screen reader users. For example, if you require your user to swipe right to complete a purchase, when the screen reader is on, the swipe right gesture moves you to the next focusable item and doesn't complete the purchase. You must be able to perform the same action by using a link, an up and down swipe or some other gesture. Uh, this, note, this requirement is similar to the exit trap requirement. However, the failure of the exit trap requirement is the user can't escape from a content, from content or a page, whereas the failure of touch gestures is that the user can't choose content or a page or that as, as in they're not trapped. And so we also have a section on how to test. So we so basically you identify any site controls. If they require any of the following gestures, is there an accessible action an actionable item provided as an alternative? And then we talk about the controls that are problematic. And so this is an example here um, of something that uh, is a pass of this requirement. So here you have, uh, we've got a series of top stories uh, and the heading indicates, uh, sorry, you can tell that there's more content by swiping by the fact that the content is cut off on the right hand side. Um, but you can also see there's a link that says see more. And if you activate that link, it goes to a page that shows you all that content. Um, another example here is uh, the Google weather. And so you can actually drag the weather to a particular time and it'll tell you what the weather is going to be. But you can also just tap on the time as a link and that will tell you what the weather is. Uh, so you can find these um, these resources at the on the Accessibility Oz website. Um, so I'll just show you now where you find them. So basically, uh, this is the home page. I will, and if you go to resources, then <clears throat> mobile testing, 
you'll get the introduction information on uh, the various different things and then the different methodologies. So this first document is uh, the actual methodology, etc. I think, you know, just the WCAG 2 requirements uh, or the equivalent of the WCAG 2 or 2.1 requirements. And then you've got a second document about mobile site testing, which talks about how you choose devices, you know, the assistive technologies, how you choose site types and variations of a page, as well as capturing errors. And then there's basically these are the test case documents or the equivalent of success criterion. So you've got the critical test cases, um, then the, just the standard mobile test cases, and then the test cases for assistive technologies and mobile features. So I'll just show you the document now. Um, so this is the document for mobile site. This is the critical test cases document. Um, and so basically you have uh, you know, the information about the exit trap, who it applies to, about this requirement. Um, at, we talk specifically about timed ads and a section on how to test non-timed features, how to test timed features. Um, and then we have some examples as well. So we do that for each one of the methodology requirements. So there's heaps of information um, and, you know, lots of things that, uh, you know, you can look at in terms of examples as what to do. Now, we are actually reforming the uh, Mobile Accessibility Committee because uh, 2.2 is probably another six months off and where, you know, we've learnt from our mistakes when it comes to 2.1 and uh, we have learnt that we can't necessarily rely on the W3C to address these requirements. And I just want to say that this is not actually unusual for the accessibility um, industry. Before uh, the W3C uh developed WCAG, they, there was actually a committee of interested accessibility specialists who wrote WCAG and that basically got just passed wholesale to W3C. They made some minor changes and that was WCAG 1. So it's very common for the accessibility industry to sort of, you know, stand up in this way. And I mean, the BBC mobile accessibility testing um, methodology was released in like 2012, 2013. So, you know, it, as I said, it's very common for the accessibility industry to do this. Um, <clears throat> we've seen it with non-ICT things as well. Um, EN301549 really is very much is the European accessibility requirements and <clears throat> they have taken on board WCAG and then gone that step further and applied WCAG to things like photocopiers and things like that. So, as I said, it's very common for the accessibility industry to do this and we are very aware that hopefully at some point the W3C will take notice of us and uh, incorporate um, some of the requirements. Um, I have staff, um, we're a W3C member and I have staff on the WCAG working group so and there are other people in the committee on the working group so it is something that we are you know trying to get the W3C involved in. Now this is also I just want to say the committee <clears throat> was uh, consisted of people from all the largest accessibility, all, all the major accessibility companies uh, around the world. But we also had, say, mobile developers who didn't know much about accessibility, but who could assist us in terms of, you know, how, why does a mobile site do this? You know, why does it show this versus that, etc. So we would love to have you involved. Um, if you don't know anything about native apps, that's fine. We're going to be continuing the separation between the two um, uh, the two committees. Uh, and so we basically will probably be a two hour meeting every couple of weeks with probably two to four hours of work outside the meetings. Um, and we're hoping to get something done in the next uh, six months. So we'd really love you to join us. And honestly, if you feel like you don't have experience, the fact that you are listening to this is, in, you know, enough experience. Um, sometimes we just need to go out and, you know, do research. And I learned a lot about mobile accessibility just being on these committees. So please do reach out to us. Um, the email is inquiries at accessibilityoz.com or you can email me directly, uh, gian at accessibilityoz.com. And I will hand over to Luke now and let's see if we've got any questions. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> You're welcome. So <laughs> I haven't got any questions in chat yet, but um, I had a few prepared. So in in the mobile space, what are, what are you seeing as the most common, you know, 
simplest things that we could be addressing that you're seeing a trend in that we should be looking at first? That's a great question. Um, I would say design. You know, um, like people who design mobile sites and native apps are designing on, you know, massive desktop computers, you know, massive screens, and they really don't know how it's going to translate into such a small screen. Um, so I think that it's really important that you get your colour contrast right because, you know, grey text on a white background is a bad idea. I don't, I feel like I've been saying this for 15 years. Grey text on a grey background is a terrible idea, <laughs> you know, like, and and really small, you know, small things people can't read, um, you know, people can't click on, et cetera. Um, so that would be one of them. But the other is use the native elements, whether they're HTML, whether they're in the native app or things like that, use the native elements because they always have accessibility inbuilt. If you have to create a new sparkling, fancy, you know, uh, user interface component, you are going to have to add in all that accessibility. And the fact is, is that even if it looks okay to you, as soon as you, you know, change the text size or the color contrast or whatever, it's going to go wonky. So use the native elements. That's probably the biggest thing that you can do. Nice. And also, it's not important that an app looks the same on an iPhone as it does on Android because the native components are going to make things look differently. It's much more important that you use the native components than you try and make the app look same, the same between the two devices because people are often, you know, they're, they're iPhone users and they're only iPhone users or they're Android users or they're only Android users. So, so they, they don't swap between the two. Um, I myself have an iPhone and an Android phone uh, for testing um, and the differences between the native UI elements are not major enough to really confuse anyone. But people are really not swapping between devices like that. Nice. Um, something I'm seeing in the industry a bit is uh, bilingual uh, on page. Ha yeah. Have you seen a lot of that in, in terms of getting accessibility issues from having multilingual uh, content in page, like on the same screen space? Um, I haven't seen anything that that's has caused problems, but there we did talk when I was uh, – working on WCAD 2 about left-hand languages versus right-hand languages and mm. how that can really, you know, mess things up. Um, so <laughs> that can, <laughs> that's something to keep an I've eye done on. Two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it just, yeah, it just makes things just that little bit more difficult. Mm. What I will say is that the, I haven't looked at recently, but six months ago, I looked at the Google um, language change feature. So you can put it on your website and say, hey, change all the language to Spanish or or whatever. And that feature itself is not accessible. So I would say um, it's less important that, well, it's not less important, but it's, it's important that you have the ability to change the language or choose the language and make that ability accessible. Um, and then you need to sort of test both in terms of, you know, how things, you know, lay out properly and what happens if someone, you know, um, you know, increases the text size or something along those lines or uses a keyboard or something like that. We do have a, a question here from uh, Andre, I think. Uh, so do you need physical devices to test the accessibility or are uh, online tools sufficient for that? You really need the physical devices. Now, you don't need to go overboard. Um, my team and myself, we have one iPhone and we have one Android device each. So you don't need to have like 15. Um, you know, so I we we test on the latest version of iOS and we've found that it doesn't really matter if you're testing an iPhone 10 or an iPhone 11 or an iPhone 11 Max or whatever. There might be some functionality issues, but they're not accessibility issues. So, you know, if you, you really only need to test on one iPhone iPad is different again because, of course, we've got iPad OS now, so it's going to be behaving differently. So you need an iPhone and an iPad, um, and then the Android devices. As I said, as long as you're testing on the Chrome, so far on the Chrome um, browser, you should be good to go. But the the we have done a lot of uh, 
looking at uh, simulators and it just is not the same. They do not behave. And especially when you start uh, throwing in accessibility features like increasing text size um, or the simplified view on Android Chrome to look at, you know, just the text of the, um, of the site, those things just do not get replicated properly on a simulator. So you really can't use a simulator. Now, I, I don't, I don't think that I'm not commenting on whether you use a simulator for functionality testing, you know, whether things actually work or not, but for accessibility testing, you really only need, um, you know, an iPhone, an iPad and an, an Android device uh, and an Android tablet if you want to go that far. Uh, but yeah, so simulators, you really, when it comes to accessibility, you cannot rely on simulators, unfortunately. Yep. The expert spoken. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah uh thanks for the explanation that's great uh in your view which organizations have great mobile accessibility good question um apple <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Uh, yeah yeah <laughs> uh google um, also, and I will say, so there's, there's, uh, we looked at, there's so many different accessibility features, um, but one of them is called reduce motion. And basically what that does is it's, it's supposed to on a site or a native app, try and like reduce any kind of movement. And this is really important because movement can be really difficult for people with ADHD. In some cases it can trigger epileptic fits. So you really do want to reduce as much motion as possible. And we found it so difficult to find a good example, well, an example of someone who had accurately used reduced motion on a website. And the only people that did was Google. So, and they had a set, they had a, um, it was Christmas a year or two ago, and they had some kind of like, uh, actually, a, a sort of like a, almost a VR experience where you, you know, went into like a, a street in London and you looked at the different uh, stores and then you went into the store websites and it had this beautiful kind of flowing effect. Um, but, you know, if you turned off reduced motion, it just worked really, really well. Um, but that was the only past version that we, and it was done by Google. It was the only um, past example we could find. Um, so it's, it is something that, you know, I mean, I've been in this industry for like 20 several years and um, I, I really, I started off testing, just not accessibility, but just testing, testing. And, you know, we had to test on Windows 95 and Windows 98, and Windows 2000, and Windows, whatever that stupid one was, Windows me or something. And it was just like, and it was, I remember thinking, oh my God. And now it, it, we're kind of back there, right? Mm -hmm. Where there's just so many different device combinations. And, you know, like when we released the latest version of the guidelines, we released them at the end of 2019 and iOS had just released dark mode and text to speech. And we're like, we don't have time to investigate all these. And, you know, like, we're like, we will do it in the next round because it takes a lot of time to actually document these features and they're often not very well documented you know there's so many different you know features that you can turn on that anyone can just stumble across on a mobile device that can just make your mobile site just crash and burn that you know it's just it's like the wild west out there um it's kind of you know it's kind of like where we were 20 years ago with with websites and you know we'll improve like as we do and then something else will come along and we'll be like oh my gosh we all need to figure out how to make vr or ar accessible or something like that um you know but it still is just kind of crazy out there and some people do it uh really well but they're the ones that have a whole lot of money you know that can start playing with these things so yeah i i haven't seen um anything I, I like i i found a lot of the examples for the methodology the pass and the fail examples and i must say finding fail examples are a whole lot easier than passing than finding pass examples and there wasn't a website that i could re reliably go to and say i'll find a pass example here um so really yeah it's just apple and google are kind of the ones that that know what they're doing Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you and listen to your talk. Um, and I'm sure we'll walk away as better developers. 
<laughs> I hope so. Um, feel free to reach out to me with any questions and, you know, let us know. It, please join the committee. But if you, you know, even if you don't, please use the guidelines and please let us know what you think. Like, oh, my God, that's so much work or this sounds really good, but I didn't really understand X. That We need feedback to figure out, you know, we, you know, when you can't see the forest for the trees, that's kind of where we're at at the moment. So we need a lot of people with new eyes to look at these and sort of say, yep, this is good or this is bad. So we'd love your feedback. Awesome. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. See you later. See ya.